Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's another beautiful day in Pinesburg. Williamsport is shiny. Rain is still having its growing impact. The young man came and mowed and showed the next door neighbor it's time for them to mow. <laughs> we thank everyone who's joining us and we pray for those in Columbia, South America as they join us throughout the week. We pray that, you're, Lord, you're working in their hearts and their minds. We also ask that you work in our hearts and our minds. We're going to start today out with the solid rock in our hymnals. Am I on? I'm yes, on. Yes, I'm going to ask Deb to finish the end. <laughs> finish. Finish what we're singing. and. Page 232, if everybody would please stand. And it's the solid rock. Next one is 509, Victory in Jesus. Me. 
thing real quick he his redeeming blood he loved me wait a second wrong way wrong place he brought me with his redeeming blood his precious blood as one young lady was singing precious blood and if we all bounced like mary does this place would be rocking this is a song of joy amen, amen? that's what i've been saying for the last couple of weeks joy the lord brings joy Amen. Beth will be presenting the scripture for today. Good morning, everyone. We're reading today from the book of Joshua. Joshua 1, 1 to 9, with verse 9 being the text verse, of the scripture verse for the sermon. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses thy servant is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not be any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for, this, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, 
that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And verse 9 is, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Bev. Thank you so much. Thank everyone who is up on the stage here with me singing and everyone who sang in the congregation. Victory in Jesus. This scripture has a lot to say about courage. Many believers say, oh, I, I trust the Lord. I'm going to follow him. The storm hits. The storm hits. The storm hits some more. I got to fix this. I got to do this. I got to control this. Where'd your courage go? Where'd your trust in the Lord go? How are you going to fix something that's not yours to fix? So now we got Joshua looking at things that he was watching happening around him. He was an assistant or whatever you want to call it to Moses. He's next in line. He grew up in the wilderness. He didn't go through the, the captivity time frame, so he grew up watching the rebellions, watching the people say, Moses, give us food, give us water, give us, give us, give us. He just watched and he learned and he saw and he followed Moses. And Moses was a replication of, Jesus, of God. He was showing what Jesus would be doing. And then, of course, when the laws are given, people rebel more. I don't want you to tell me how to live. I don't want you to tell me how to believe. I don't want you to tell me to do things just because you want me to. But when God says something is necessary, it's necessary. The structure of the world is not ours. It's not God's. It's, it's man's. Man messes things up, man creates challenges, and then they get upset when somebody argues with them. We know that, and we'll have this conversation one day when we, when we take and explore the book of Samuel, when we talk about how God told them, you don't need a king. And everybody wants to be like everyone else, so that's what the Israelis said. We want to be like everyone else. They all have a king. And then God says, okay, yes, you, you, you can have your king. If you disrespect me, this is what a king will do. And we'll touch on that in the next time I get up here. It's going to talk about things that you'll see the parallels in today's world. You don't have control over your life when you give it to a king, when you give it to a government. God controls our lives, yes, but he does it in ways that benefit us, to help us grow, to help us become better people. So, Moses is dying, or has died. Joshua is next in line. There's something interesting, I don't know if all of you all know this or not, but Joshua is first mentioned in the Old Testament when Moses appointed him to command the Israelite army in the battle against the Amalekites. He's regularly identified as Moses' servant in the sense of an executive officer or aide de camp, which means he's the assistant who gets everything done. His name means, let me get to another space here, Joshua, the Hebrew name Yeshua, is the origin of the English name Joshua and is often interpreted as, as well, get this now, listen, Yahweh is salvation or God is deliverance. Yeshua. You know who Yeshua is? That's Jesus. So Joshua is, is showing us what Jesus is going to do. From the Old Testament to the New Testament. Old Testament shows what's going to happen in the New Testament. Yahweh is salvation. Whew. 
Think about that for a minute. Old Testament is talking, as it did in Genesis, about Melchizedek, who's a representation of Jesus as well. Jesus shows up all throughout the Bible, so you can't separate the Old Testament from the New Testament. You can't read one without knowing the other. It's a complete storyline. 66 different books, multiple authors. If you don't believe it's inspired by God, you haven't read it with an understanding of, what is this telling me? It's telling you that you can't do it all by yourself. We're working through Romans in our Sunday morning Bible study, and I mean, we're trying to work our way through it because I get sidetracked quite frequently. But Romans is the early phase of Christianity. So you've got Jewish people who in the Old Testament are told about the laws, and the laws are supreme, and the laws also make you recognize what sin is. That's what Paul writes in there. The law tells me what sin is. It makes me aware of it. Grace, which is what God gives us in the New Testament, tells me who God is. Jesus brings grace. But there's some things that people always miss. There's some caveats to Christianity. Caveats of following God. When you think about it, God says three different times, I think maybe even four, but let's go with three. Be strong and courageous. Live a life that's different. Courage. Something we don't think about nowadays. Because we're bombarded with so much information, we don't have time to think about courage. Courage is, a, is actually go, the ability to go against the norm. Go against what everybody else says you should do because what they're telling you to do is not right. Courage is to live a life that shows something different. Courage is swimming against the, the tide. When people say, oh, you need to swim because the tide's going that way, but it's taking you to the waterfall. So why am I going to swim to the waterfall? I'm going to swim against it or get out of the river. It's just how people are. But we're afraid because we see things and we're human and we, we take that fear because we're taught about fear as we grow up. Don't touch the stove. Okay, get it. You don't want to burn your hand. That's a normal thing. Don't run out in the street. Well, yeah, that makes sense because I might get hit by a car. But then we start growing and experiencing things and we say, hmm, if I don't do this on a regular basis, eventually you stop doing other things. And Jesus says, or God says, and this is another translation of, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good, this is the King James, no, I'm sorry, it is not. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, yeah, this is King James, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. The New English translation, which takes away all the flowery words, and that's okay. It's, to me, it's a very clean, Americanized version. I repeat, be strong and brave. Do not be afraid and don't panic. For I, this is the key, I, the Lord, your God, am with you in all you do. NIV says the same thing. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. See how the words are a little different? They say exactly the same thing. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. That's reminiscent of Jesus in Matthew 28, saying, I will be with you always. Again, Old Testament is reflected in the New Testament. It's a beautiful book. Beautiful book. So God speaks directly to Joshua, following the death of Moses, his servant. There's a transition there. Life is about transitions. 
transition from being the child to an adult and you move away from the household, but your moms and dads still want to tell you how to live your life. And in a lot of ways, we need to listen to that. It's the same thing with God. He allows us to grow in the spirit, but then we tend to want to break away. And he keeps telling us, no, 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 do it my way because this is the safe way. Oh, come on, everybody else is doing it. No, 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 don't follow the, the crowd. The crowd will lead you astray. We're coming into an election. Well, we're in an election cycle. It's a mess. It's, it's almost chaotic. <laughs> One's anointed, the other is vilified. The vilified one tends to be more pragmatic. I'll leave that there. Joshua has to follow Moses. There's some shoes to fill, aren't they? Moses. Moses is referred to how many times by the Pharisees? <laughs> All the time. We follow the laws of Moses. <sighs> Joshua comes in and starts showing them what the love of Jesus is. The spiritual leadership is what he brings. They miss that because they're living in the moment. God knows that jo uh, Joshua needs that encouragement, so he repeats it frequently. Be a courageous person. He repeats it frequently. He doesn't leave him alone. He tells him he'll be with him. He's got another task that a lot of people miss. He takes them to battle. It's not that he is there to fight the battles. Each tribe fights their own battles. He's the guiding force. He's the one who breaks up the property. He's the one who assigns the places everybody's going to live. But he also is encouraging them. How many times do you feel like you're fighting that battle? You go into that storm alone. Sometimes we don't think about it. We just respond to it. Then when it gets harder, and I'm going to say this in a way to I hope it's understandable, when the storm rages harder, rages more fervently, more viciously against us, oh, then we reach out to the Lord. When the storm comes, the prayer should start. When the storm is brewing and it's over the horizon and you have a sense that something's changing in your life, prayers should start. You should go into that storm, into that battle with the full armor of God on. Not, oh, I'm going to thwart this storm by doing this different thing. And God says, okay, how's this going to work out for you? Then you struggle, then you wrestle, then you yell. He's just like, when are you going to ask me what to do? When are you going to let me guide you? You did it 20 times before. Why are you fighting this one on your own? So when you go into that storm, what are you going to do? You're going to pray. And then you ask some friends to pray for you, pray with you. So you're building a force that's going to be tougher for the, 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 the devil to battle against you. I don't remember which prophet it is, which storyline it is, but I do know that one of God's prophets is looking at the forces around him and his helper says, what are we going to do? We need to, we need to turn around and leave. And he prays for God to open his helper's eyes. And his eyes are open. And he sees the angels and all that's going to happen to those who are after them. God's got you. Pastor has the bracelets that say that. God's got this. Amen. That's what prayer does. It builds up your fortress. It builds up the, the battlements. It allows God to say, this one relies on me. As he crossed the Euphrates, I've got you. God builds that property, so to speak. This is your boundaries. This is the land that you're provided for. This is what I'm giving you. And there are some tribes, I think two or three tribes, that say, we want to stay on this side of the Euphrates. We don't want to cross over. And when they stayed, they became part of the world. They're considered the lost tribes. You'll read about them in Judges, and that gets scary. 
<laughs> when you abandon the Lord, whew, you're just asking for him to abandon you. And that's the scariest thing you could ever want, is to be there alone. So God sets boundaries. That's what the laws are. They're boundaries. The Ten Commandments are boundaries. You hit the guardrails, you bounce back, right? If you flip over to guardrails, then that means you weren't, you weren't really supposed to be hitting that guardrail at all. You should have been in a whole different place. The saying, what would Jesus do? We all know how popular that was at times. My response as I grew in the, in the word, what would Jesus do? He wouldn't be there. That's why you asked for the prayers. So he redirects you. So you're not at that cliff. You're not at that waterfall. You're not at that dangerous place. And your spiritual health is more important than you realize. Because when you are suffering from physical things, as Pastor said, you're limping. Yeah, I'm limping. I've got something going on with my body. Tripped and fell, rolled, all that good stuff. Two weeks later, it starts bothering me. But I have faith. I can get through this with his help. I'm not doing it alone. I've got good friends who recommend and think things through with me. I'm not alone. Verse 5 talks about the assurance God has for us. No one will be able to resist you all the days of your life. What about that? If you're in the Word, if you're dwelling on God, people come to you because you're peaceful. You've got that special aura, as the saying goes. You just have a way that people feel comfortable around you. As we approach the end times, we've got to be ready. We've got to be in that place where no matter what, you're comfortable. Last week was one of those challenges. I'm here. Bev couldn't make it. Deb couldn't make it. I got those messages. I prayed. <laughs> I didn't say, I got this. I prayed. Then I said, okay, now this is what I need to do. And everything worked. Hadn't sung all by myself up here. Everything worked. It's amazing when you just stay calm and let the Lord take the lead. You'll hear me say that over and over and over again. Trusting in Him is, is so important. It gives you that peace. Ralph went in to the hospital this week, had some stents put in. Prayer monsters. That's what we become, not just warriors. We're monsters. We want to gobble up all the evil and just give Him total protection. He comes through, He's here. He ain't moving as fast as he used to, but he's getting over it. That's a big surgery. Yeah, he couldn't move too fast anyway. <laughs> and here's Pastor. Then where we go? <laughs> he can outrun him in a day. I, I don't know. I don't want to see that ever happening because both of you will fall over and I'm going to have to be doing a lot of praying. And I just got my CPR recertified, so I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, they're denying that request. But we want to be there watching over each other in prayer. But God calls Joshua to strength in verse 6. God charges Joshua to be strong and brave, or strong and courageous, for he will lead the people to inherit the land promised to his ancestors. Our goal is to lead people with courage towards the Lord. Then when we get them there, if they stay in our midst, we're supposed to lead them through the war, through the battles. When they say, I take and accept Jesus, what's the next step? Get with them. Start getting them to understand the Bible and how it's easier to read than you think. It's easier to understand with some help. After a while, you start hearing it and seeing it. You start knowing it. You start understanding the whole picture it's just how it works. And it works for the seasoned Christian as well as the newbie. Mm -hmm. Pastor and I do Bible studies and sometimes he looks at me and goes, I didn't see that. So a lot of times I go, I didn't see that. We read sometimes just to read. Then when we read and stop after a couple of sentences and say, what is this saying? 
That's saying a lot. It's challenging us to do a lot. The strength and courage that is required to live a daily life is not coming from our own making, but comes from the assurance of God's presence and his promise. Every day you wake up and you thank him for the breath of life. Every day you wake up after you thank him for the breath of life, you ask him, what is it you want me to do today? Show me who I should be planting the seed in. How should I live my life so somebody sees you? I don't know if I'm looking at my mortality any more than I ever has, but I think I am, and I start realizing, you don't know how long you're going to be on this earth. You don't know how much influence you have on other people. God is saying, be of courage, be of good cheer, be one who sh excuse me, shares the word <clears throat> because he's imparted that in you. He's put the spirit in you. He's commanded you to share the gospel. When you disappear, he's got to fill that void. Hopefully he's filling that void with somebody you've planted the seed with. But then maybe not. Then he's planning, filling my void with somebody Bev's planted the seed with. Pastor's planted the seed with. Deb's planted the seed with. But if everybody's planting five seeds, and every one of those five seeds plants five more seeds, you get the multiplication part. So if I plant, as pastor's planted many seeds and brought many to the Lord. Now not all of them come to the church, come to our church. Some go to other churches. Some just stay stagnant. They're saved, don't get me wrong. But God asks more of us than that. He asks more of us, that of us. He wants these feet to move out and to share the word. I've had people say to me, oh, I, I praise him in private. I pray, pray in private. Well, who sees that? God only. Okay, that's fine. That's perfect. Not completely what he's asking. And you're going to stumble. You're going to make some silly statements. You're going to say something out of context because you didn't get that five-minute rule when you get in somebody's conversation. You need to be in that conversation for five minutes so you can understand what everybody's talking about. Then you can put your two cents in if they allow you. Because you sometimes want to say, can I, can I say something here? Unless you're in a really good close friendship, then you can just say what you need to say. But be a part of the conversation before you be a part of the conversation. You want them to know what they're talking about. You want to understand what they're talking about. So there's no misunderstanding of what you're saying. Obedience to God's law. Joshua is told to be very strong and brave in observing the law given through Moses. He instructs them to turn, not to turn from the law to the right or the left. Symbolizes that it's an unwavering commitment to stay straight. Stay in the rules. Stay with the Lord. Do what he's asking us to do. Our societal pressures are really great. Do this because everybody else is doing it. And that's why I stopped watching the TV because I don't want the news. Fortunately, my YouTube channel still has news or advertisements. I don't, want to, I don't want all that influence. So I'm getting ready to put a little bit of money in there so I don't get all of that. But I can still discern it and hit the button when it says, oh, Move on. Skip this. Skip this. Discernment is what he gives you through all of this as well. But he asked Joshua to read the laws. Read the scripture. Take the scripture into his mind. He says here, Joshua, this is my words of what the Bible is telling us. Joshua is commanded to meditate on the law day and night, to keep it on his lips. That's what he's asking us to do. Read the Bible, know the Bible, so it's there when your opportunity to share it comes. The Word of God is to be internalized, guiding every decision and action. In this time and day, we need to have those words in our mind, on our lips for our own guidance as well as others. Because sometimes you want to get there and yell at the TV and 
throw something at it and change the channel and something else is there that you don't want to see and you get frustrated. You might say that one thing that you wouldn't say in front of other people. God doesn't want that. He wants you to be consistent. Meditate on the word. Know the word. Be in season all the time because somebody's watching what you're doing, especially in public, that you don't even know is watching you. My days at the mission, I had people come up to me and goes, oh, you're actually doing what you're supposed to do here. I'm like, what? I've been coming here for 10 years. and Some guys come in as a chaplain and they talk this talk and then they walk outside and I see them on the streets and they're doing something everybody else is doing. I said, oh, okay. I said, no, I see you out there with people. You're in the streets. You're talking to them. You're putting your arms around them. You're praying with them. I said, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. And don't get me wrong. It didn't happen overnight where I just walked into the mission and that was what I was doing. Oh, I had to let go of a lot of my own self. And then when I learned what I was was gifted at doing, I stopped being me and started being what God wanted. And I'm lucky because people do respect me. But I love and respect them back. And Deb will tell you there are times where they were like, where's Pastor Earl? Where's Pastor Earl? I'm like, I'm just a regular guy. But not to them because if you show you care, people don't get that enough. And, it, and I don't mind wearing that on my sleeve. I used to have so much pride. It was like, oh, I, oh, oh, I'm going to do what I want to do and tell you what I want you to know, and then I'm going to just leave it there. Now I, man, I can't leave most of them alone. There's some I have to walk away from. Don't get me wrong. When I am there praying and talking and, and giving people guidance and they're doing their own thing, after a while I have to move on. Everybody needs to recognize when you're just spinning your wheels. That's what Jesus told the crowd he sent out to prophetize and bring win people. He said, if they're not listening, shake off the dust off of your sandals and move on. But then there are those who stick with it, and they struggle, and they fall, and they call. When they don't call me, I call them. Oh, I'm glad you called me. I fell. So? Life is a struggle. Life has its trips. Not the figurative or the literal like poor Bev had. But the figurative, where you fall off the wagon, you're trying to get off of drugs, you're trying to get off alcohol, you're trying to get off of both, and then you go somewhere and somebody shows up, hey man, why don't you try this? It'll make you feel good today. Ah, one won't hurt. Well, you've been away from it for long enough, one impacts you like that. We have our own trigger points, no matter what we think. We need God to guide us. Whether you're de dependent on and a substance, a tough dependent on a person. God comes first. Everyone else comes second, third, and fourth. Meditate on the law. Meditate on Scripture. Immerse ourselves in God's Word. And then practice what it's saying. If He says to love one another as you love yourself, learn how to love yourself. Amen. Recognize that we're here because he created us in his image. That means spiritual image. We're in his image physically as well. As nobody knows what he looks like. There's a reason for that. Because when Dr. Carson says when he peeled back people's scalps, it's the same matter. It's the same thing inside all of us. So what's on the outside is just that. It's not representative of what you should think of that person just because you see a different shade. As one pastor calls it, the melanin is different. Some of us have very little melanin. Some of us have much melanin. doesn't mean you're any different. doesn't mean you should be treated any differently. Because God will treat you in a way that's not favorable if you do that. We're supposed to treat each other well. It's not just about color. It's about ethnicity. The Irish were treated poorly in the day. The Jews are still mistreated. Because people are dirty. People are mean. People are rude. There's no superior race. 
I don't care what anybody tells you. Only in your own mind. But then let's remember, God will deal with him. He will deal with you. It looks like I need to speed myself up here. Getting a little long-winded. Pastor saying, come on now, get done. Conclusions. Now, I started my writing of this, and I rewrote it, and rewrote it, and rewrote it, and rewrote it. And it says, hmm, this is the conclusion, right? Then I go into the altar call, start praying on the altar call, because I... I've been moved to say more than just come to the Lord. <sighs> so I'm going to say, this is the end of the verse part. We're going to start doing something else. But when I go there and I say, let's talk about coming to the Lord, that's when it's going to get a little more serious. Verse 9 is a reiteration of the command. This Verse, again, is very important to the day because we can be overwhelmed by the darkness that's coming our way. We all know about the end times. We understand Revelation. Well, we understand what Revelation's about. We don't understand Revelation as much as we'd like to. Those who say, this is what's going to happen based on exactly what the Bible says, yes, that's what's going to happen. When and how and in what order, we have no clue. So it only matters that you know what God is asking of us. Remember, Matthew 28, 20, I said earlier, I remember, and remember, I will be with you to the end of the age. It's translated that way more often than not in all the translations. Joshua 6 through 9 are the key phrases for me. It speaks powerfully of the need to strengthen your courage in today's world. Especially talks about the approach to the end times. Like Joshua, believers are called to step out in faith. Step out in faith. Grounded in the promise of God. Obedient to his word. There it's the key. You'll hear this all the time. Obedience. God wants obedience over sacrifice. Be confident in his unwavering presence. This courage is not about self-reliance, but about relying on the one who has promised to be with you whenever you need him. But don't wait until you're in need. Be in conversation with him all the time. Today we face our own uncharted territories. The world around us is changing rapidly. Signs of the times are kind of scary, aren't they? You think about what's next. Where are we going? It's not, a, it's not a fun thing to think about. It should bring us closer to God, but it also should bring us closer to fulfilling the commandment of prophesizing, asking people to listen to the Lord. Don't follow a man. Follow the Lord because we all stumble. We all mess up. But the Lord is going to be there for you. And we need to take that worry and fear out of our lives because he's telling us, do not worry. Do not have fear. Be courageous. And that's what we have to worry about. Is is our courage going to be strong enough? And if we don't feel it's going to have that strength, we take it to him in prayer. I want to invite anybody who's struggling with that to look at what God has to offer for them. To come to him To learn what the courage is all about. I know many of us, maybe one of you out here is trying to figure out what's like, what this life is bringing, what this life has to offer. As I've learned, and many people in this room have learned, what it has to offer is what God wants us to do. has a lot to offer in how we care about other people. In a discussion earlier, somebody said, I've been tasked to care for people. That's what he's asking. You don't have to be that loving, motherly type person to do it, but you have to care for people. You have to know that they don't want to go to hell. And what's the option? Jesus. Simple as that. 
So if you haven't taken Jesus into your heart, it's very simple. But it has to be sincere. You can't just say, Jesus, come into my heart. I want to change. No, no, no. It takes a bigger step. It's called repentance. God and ask for forgiveness of your sin. A- acknowledging that you have sin. We all have sin. We're sinful by nature. We come out of the womb crying. We come out of the womb chasing after things, being curious. That's fine. Curiosity is good. As long as you have somebody guiding you so you don't put your hand on the stove all the time. <laughs> don't touch that, that dangerous relationship just because. And people are toxic. People are wrong. People are crazy. And then when they get Jesus in them, they they. St- There's no time frame for change, people. Recognize that. There's there's no concept of how fast somebody's supposed to change. It's God's will. He worked slowly in me. He didn't work fast in anybody in here. But as we grow in the Spirit, He changes us. We don't go back very easily. He doesn't want us to go back. He wants us to put our hands on the plow and look forward, moving steadily in a new way. So if this is a move you have today to come to Jesus, I ask you to come to Jesus to say this. The first thing you do is just ask the Lord to come into your heart and acknowledge that you are a sinner. Let him know that. Because once the Spirit comes inside of you, I'm going to use Mary as an example. You're going to want to sing those songs with a little bit of joy and a little bit of body motion and just let him know that you are happy in a way that you can't control. It just springs on you and you just want to just praise the Lord. Come into my heart. You want to show him that you're there for him, with him, and, and it, all of his work is through him, you, by him. So if you want to take that call, just, just pray this prayer with me. Bow your heads and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I know that you can change my life. I give my heart to you. I accept Jesus into my heart. I accept you, Lord. Please change me. That's a start. You say amen. That's a start. Then the next step is working on your fears, your anxieties, and being in the Word. Old and New Testament people, both, they matter. It's a huge connection. I always recommend the New Testament. Mark is a great one to start with if you're new to it. Understand what Jesus brings to us. He brought a new way to live to those who were living under the law. Because the law showed them what sin was. Jesus is showing that sin can be washed away with his blood. It could be a saving grace. A new way of living. Changes all your relationships for sure. So as we wrap up today, those of you who have accepted Jesus today, join the family. Be a part of it. Come to a church. Work out your salvation with others. Joshua had to be the leader. He was trained. A lot of times he didn't know it was being a training. A lot of times we don't understand he's preparing us for that storm. He puts us in the storm, but yeah. We're getting trained and we're prepared because we know to pray. But he also has given us the experience with little things that have happened in our lives. There are times when you don't know the answers and you don't hear God. So you ask a friend or two. A lot of wisdom comes from others. He's blessed us all in different ways. So when you're having those fearful moments, that, that anxiety, look to the Lord. Ask for his help. Be strong and courageous. For a lot of us, it's that strength to just ask the Lord because we want to do it ourselves. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, give us the strength, the courage to step out in faith, to know you, to love you, to do what you ask, to be obedient, to do what Jesus has asked us to love one another as we love ourselves to love one another as he's loved the church not to be prideful not to be opinionated in a harmful way 
but to be the vessels, to be the guiding force in this world. No matter what is done in the world, we want to be apart from the world. We want to be that shining light on the hill. Lord, give us that focus throughout this week as we move about the day. Bring us back next week and on Wednesday to worship you, to praise you, and to learn from you. Lord, I ask all of this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And we are finished. Pastor, what's your words of uh, encouragement before we leave? Don't do anything dumb.